the summer workshop on the dynamic brain, team science, and community outreach. Representing the team is Michael Bice, Nika Keller, Sean Olson, and David Fang. Please join me in welcoming them. Thank you, Justin. Um, so we're going to tell you about something a little different. Instead of being uh, a straight science talk, this is actually some, uh, a talk about our efforts at community outreach um, and, and education, and specifically this, this summer workshop on the dynamic, dynamic brain that we've been running for the past four years. So we like to talk a lot about data, tools, and knowledge, and this is an important thing, and one of our, you know, our, our mission is to deliver these things to the scientific community, if you will. Ah. Uh, our mission is to deliver these things to the scientific community, but of course this is a feedback loop, right? This requires interaction with the scientific community because the scientific community is of course producing these things as well. So back when uh, uh, Christoph Koch eventually jo uh, is initially joined the Institute, uh, he and Adrian Fairhall at the University of Washington had a particular idea. Both of them uh, have a long history of founding and administering these kind of summer courses, but they said the Allen Institute actually provides an unprecedented uh, 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 opportunity to combine, the, to, to build a kind of summer workshop that has the tools that the Allen Institute has uh, to build a, a different educational experience. So you take the, the Allen Institute's chocolate, if you will, and combine it with the University of Washington's peanut butter, part of which is the Friday, Friday Harbor Laboratories campus, which is actually an important part. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it sounds nice and idyllic and it is all of those things. Uh, but it's actually an important part of the environment necessary for creating the way that, you know, the way the course works and creating uh, the kind of environment that we want because it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, there's very little to do other than what we want people to do. Um, <laughs> so all of this comes together for the summer workshop, uh, which is, as I said, is jointly administered by the University of Washington and the Allen Institute uh, with some generous funding added from the Simons Foundation. And it basically rests on three pillars. So we've got open science that we want to teach. This is something we like to practice here. Uh, we think it's very important to science itself, and so we teach this by teaching students open tools. We teach them Python. We teach them about our own tools. Uh, we teach them collaborative tools like Git. You'll hear about more of this uh, uh, later in the talk. And of course, we teach them about our own data, which they get access to. So this is some, somewhat unprecedented. These very large data sets get used in these kind of, uh, kind of courses. Uh, in addition, we teach team science. So the way the course is structured, Lectures are an important part, but they're actually not the primary reason the students are there. The main reason the students are there is to work together collaboratively in groups to accomplish some kind of actual scientific project of their own design, uh, influenced by lecturers and TAs and so forth, of course, but ultimately of their own design, uh, using our tools and data. And that's actually what we want out of this process. And finally, of course, in addition to open science team science, we teach some neuroscience uh, by having some, some prominent lecturers, uh, both internal and external, uh, lectures from the Institute and from the University of Washington actually come in and, and teach some, teach some uh, courses. Um, so a few specifics. That's, we, we aim for 24 students. We try to get a, a mixture of experimental and computational about half and half so that we can actually mix some, some kinds of expertise and intuition uh, so that we get a better mixture for those group projects. Um, and one of the things we started doing a couple of years ago is we created what we called the Python Boot Camp, which is a two-day crash course in Python. Uh, which, in my opinion, over the last two years has really changed the dynamic of the course. One of the things I remember that, that as Sean and I were putting together the, uh, the survey for the third year, uh, we came across this question that at the time, I'm sure, sounded perfectly reasonable, uh, but which read, how did you feel about the two-hour introduction to Python? Um, uh, which perhaps was a little fast. So we created the Python boot camp to turn that two hours into 16 hours, uh, which I think changed, changed the workshop dramatically. And, and this is now the fourth year we've done this. We just finished the fourth workshop about two or three months ago, uh, whatever August was. <laughs> okay, so um, a little more about the specifics of what the environment is like. So the first three days are actually quite intense. Um, you know, you've got your standard meal schedule, lectures in the morning, and then we actually sort of inundate people for three days with material we've prepared to teach them about our uh, software tools to access our data. Uh, and eventually this workshop turns into open work time, which in fact, and what I'm not even explicitly mentioning here is after dinner, uh, which in fact is where much of the work gets done. So I'm, the reason I, part of the reason I'm mentioning this is that, that one of the quirks of Friday Harbor Laboratories is they have a, an excellent dining hall staff that works very particular hours. They work these, well, they work 
all day, but they serve you during these hours. They do not serve you before, and they do not serve you after that, those times, um, except when the next time comes around. Um, so this actually produces an interesting effect, uh, that coupled with the lack of places to congregate on campus, that the dining hall kind of is, where, is the place to be. This is where TAs congregate, this is where students congregate, and you wind up with mostly 24-7 outside of lectures, this kind of environment where people are banging away on our tools and data, solving their problems uh, almost all the time. So I wanna point out a couple of interesting features of this photograph. One is that it is night. This is 9.30, something like that. And it, during the course, once everything gets, gets, gets revved up, it is not unusual to see this same site at about one o'clock in the morning. Um, people are working all the time. It's actually a really nice atmosphere where people dive into things. The other fact that uh, I think supports what I just said is it's somewhat subtle, but this is in fact a time-lapse photograph, um, <laughs> right? So <laughs> you can see I'm talking to Phantom Sean over there in the, in the corner, and, and uh, um, this person over here is, is a little bit fuzzy, but most people have been working hard for a consistent period of time. Okay. So the course has grown over the past few years. Um, when we started this, we had uh, you know, the, the Mouse Brain Connectivity Atlas and the Gene Expression Atlases, and we scraped together some pedagogical material to teach people how to use these things. And then in future years, so the, the, the course was turned over to, to Sean and me uh, to administer in terms of developing pedagogy, and we, we drove over the years to actually put together um, a lot of pedagogical materials, Jupyter Notebooks, which you'll hear more about, and as things moved on, as we, we released new products like the Brain Observatory, the technical requirements of this actually sort of ramped up. So we have a nice linear scaling in text on the slide from year to year, but there's a super linear scaling in the technological infrastructure that was necessary to support this. So Nika is actually gonna tell you a great deal about how all the problems that, that, that it produced and the problems and how we solved those problems. In addition, people are of course doing science. So you actually heard already uh, one of the next-gen leaders um, was a member of the MECA team uh, with Judy Prasad, Eva Dyer, uh, and you heard about some of the work that she started at the, at the summer workshop and is continuing to, and continuing to work on. Uh, Sean will tell you more about both these projects and the, the outcomes of the course. And then finally, David's going to tell you a bit about the, um, uh, the things that we've learned and closing that feedback loop. But before I turn it over to Nika to tell you about the technology, I actually wanted to mention that this itself is a team science problem. Uh, this is not a few people. This is a bunch of people working very hard. Um, and I certainly want to call out everybody who's below that first line because the, the course, in my opinion, and I think Sean would share this opinion, is made by these people and how much they work and how much they've, they've given to the course. Um, it's because of these people and what they do that we can have a situation where students are up till one o'clock in the morning and someone is there to help them with a question. Um, this is actually not just from me. This is one of the uh, consistent points of feedback we get about the course. So this is something someone said on the most recent survey, um, but this is not cherry picked in terms of sentiment. This is something we get uh, to hear from several students every single year. And at least for my money, this is the thing that I'm, I'm most proud of, and I think Sean shared, would share this opinion, that we've constructed this atmosphere and that the TAs support that. So everybody who's worked on that, I specifically want to thank you for creating that. So. Hi everyone, I'm here to talk about some of the tools and technologies behind this workshop. Um, first, I would like to give you a quick view of how we did things in the past and the problems that we ran into. So besides instruction, one of the primary ways that, the, uh, that we uh, contribute to the workshop is providing that data. And that was the data that um, Michael just talked about. And the last few years, we've given students uh, these hard drives containing the, this data. And because of the limited capacity of these drives, this data had to be carefully curated. And this is a very difficult process, as you can understand. Like, it's like, you can imagine this being a bit like choosing your favorite child. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and also, like, one other problem with having these hard, dri hard drives is that, you know, you, like, you have to move it from one place to another. You have to make sure that you don't drop these and lose that data. Um, uh, one also, we so we gave students uh, these drives and they had to be connected to their personal computers. This is where the uh, project work happens. 
Um, in order to make efficient use of this data, we provide students our own home homegrown software called the Allen Software Development Kit, or the Allen SDK. This software, along with its many dependencies, like it had to be installed on uh, these, each of the students' uh, computers. Um, this is not as, uh, as simple as this might sound, this, uh, this has led to many hours of frustration and has taken a lot of time out of valuable workshop time. And the root cause of the problem is that uh, we have tw about 24 students, and with 20, so we have 24 different computer configurations to accommodate. And uh, we try, a few years ago, we tried to simplify this process and remove this variability by uh, using virtual machines. But this was ultimately not su successful because um, you still had to install new software on 24 different computers. Uh, also this year, we decided to add another homegrown software, software called the Modeling SDK, and this had its own dependencies that needed to be installed and configured on the computers. Um, these were the major pain points, but there were also other areas for improvement. Um, in the past, the students used to share source code using um, just email, but this is very hard to uh, keep, you know, it's very hard to keep track of the history of the changes uh, in your email, and it leads to like having um, an inbox full of noise. So this year, we, just, uh, we took a new approach in uh, providing students with uh, a work environment. These are all the tools and technologies that we use this year, and I'm going to give a quick overview of each one. So one of the tools that we've used in the past and have continued to use um, today is Wikispaces. Wikispaces is a traditional wiki platform that has features for creating a virtual classroom. So for the course, the instructors put course material like you know, the schedule, as you can see in this picture, and um, presentation slides, public announcements um, on Wikispaces. Um, the first on the list of new tools for the students this year was GitHub. GitHub is an online repository for um, for saving, for having um, source code and uh, other artifacts. One of the major parts of this co the course this year was uh, using source control, and this was very important in teaching students how to collaborate on software projects. We also use GitHub uh, to distribute course material and for uh, making the student projects accessible publicly. And this was our, uh, the repository for the um, student projects. The next, another tool that we used this year was Slack. Slack is a cloud-based instant messaging tool. And this was used by everyone for just quick communication. Um, students used it for, uh, for collaboration. Um, instructors used it for communication among themselves and answering the questions that were raised by the students. Uh, we also used it for all the behind the scene operations that we're, uh, we're doing and um, as a platform to make announcements as well. So these next set of tools that I'm going to talk about address that dependency problem that I talked to you about earlier. Uh, so we basically created an environment for students that was fully managed by us using Jupyter Notebooks. Um, this is an example of a notebook, and Jupyter Notebooks are um, these documents that can run code and display visualizations, all while be, like, being accessible from a web browser. Uh, so with Basic, and Jupyter Hub allowed us to run dedicated notebooks for each student uh, concurrently on a small number of servers. And with this setup, all the students had to do was go to a website. So, um, so how did we create that environment? We used two other tools. We used Docker and AWS. Uh, Docker is a tool that uh, allows a software developer to package up an application with all of its dependencies, in including the ones at the operating system level. Um, so this turns an application into a portable image that can be run on any machine whether it's, uh, that has Docker installed, whether it's a developer's desktop or a production server. So for the workshop, we created an image that had the Allen SDK, the modeling SDK, and all of their dependencies running within Jupyter Hub. Now we needed to find a place to host the, uh, this image and run it. We decided to use Amazon Web Services, or AWS. Um, AWS provides cloud-based, pay-as-you-go um, computing resources. And as you can see in this diagram, all the infrastructure we used for the course was hosted on AWS, including data. Um, that meant that there was 
no, amount, no limit to the amount of data that we could use uh, for the course and provide students. And also, we didn't have to worry about dropping these hard drives and losing that data. Um, so all the infrastructure, all the AWS resources that we used for the course was paid for by Amazon Research Credits. And we'd like to thank Amazon uh, for making this all possible, and specifically Jet Sonwal for uh, helping us get these credits. So how did using all of these tools like help us uh, in the course? So we went from providing just hundreds of megabytes of data to about 40 terabytes. Um, and about hundreds of emails turned into more than 10,000 messages on Slack. And the student setup time went from days to just 10 minutes, and this was a huge improvement. And the students learned how to collaborate, and their efforts were um, present, preser preserved in a shared code repository rather than being buried in their email inboxes. So now Sean is going to talk about uh, some of the outcomes of the course and some of the feedback we've gotten. Hi, I'm Sean Olson. I would like to talk about some of the ways that we're evaluating the success and impact of the course. One way is to conduct an end of course, oh, sorry. One way is to conduct an end of course <laughs> survey uh, that has over 70 questions that covers the content, structure, and student experience of the course. Uh, at a very high level, we've received very positive feedback. So in response to a question like this, how satisfied were you with the course overall? Uh, all of the students gave the highest scores. Uh, this was, again, not cherry-picked. Uh, this is a general sentiment that, that students were very excited about this course. One of the challenging things is the requirement that the students learn and use Python in this course. So uh, when they arrive, only 22% uh, of the student body over the last couple of years knew Python. 76% of students, most of them, ultimately were happy that they learned it during the course and, and used it with their projects. And only one student thought learning Python was a complete waste of their time. Uh, the survey also reveals uh, how students might think the course will affect their ongoing research and career. Uh, so students report that it helped them get into a new field. They get excited about uh, big science, open science. And ultimately, many students leave the course with uh, an idealistic glow <laughs> encapsulated maybe by this, 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 this last quote here. I want to be part of something bigger and truly aimed at making a difference. I want to serve the greater good. Uh, so we think that this level of enthusiasm uh, has translated into word of mouth buzz and has led to an increase in the number of applications we get each year for this course. So this continues to grow. Last year we received 235 uh, applications, which amounts to a very stringent 10% acceptance rate, uh, which means that we're able to select uh, a very high quality cohort of students each year from diverse backgrounds with complementary uh, skill sets. So one of the main goals, as Michael mentioned, uh, of this course is for students to actually carry out meaningful uh, projects during the two-week workshop, which is actually a short amount of time. And these projects uh, reflect many of the dominant themes in current computational and systems neuroscience, including neuropopulation dynamics, the relationship of structure to function, and the analysis and visualization of high-dimensional uh, neural data sets. Uh, for example, uh, this image down at the bottom left here um, comes from a team project um, that explores dimensionality reduction techniques on the brain observatory data set. And what they illustrate here is the encapsulation of uh, data from hundreds of individual neurons that are projected down to a two-dimensional subspace such that you can see clear uh, stimulus-driven neural tra trajectories. So each color here represents a different visual stimulus, and you can see that they clearly diverge in this subspace that is not apparent or clearly apparent at the level of uh, a population of hundreds of neurons. 
Uh, so one very encouraging aspect of this course that we've observed is that following the two-week uh, workshop, uh, a good number of students continue working on uh, projects that were initiated at the course. For example, uh, we heard from Eva Dyer yesterday, who is one of the uh, next-gen uh, leaders, uh, who uh, included this particular image in the uh, workshop final presentation uh, a couple years ago. All right. So many projects or a handful of projects that uh, continue past the course have actually made their way uh, into full-fledged publications, posters, and collaborations on ongoing studies at the Allen Institute. For example, uh, this team here of Sid, Rich, and Mark got extremely excited about the mouse mesoscale connectome. And during the course, they wanted to uh, think of a generative model, a set of simple rules that could produce in a virtual network the same properties that the mouse connectome uh, 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 manifests. So during the course, they worked, it on a, they worked on a simpler problem of undirected graphs, and then once they got home in the ensuing months, they worked out a more challenging problem of directed graphs that ultimately uh, led to this eLife publication. So beyond the, the projects that are initiated at the course, uh, we believe that we're providing students with uh, important tools uh, in, uh, for dealing with the modern uh, neural data deluge. Uh, and these really straddle the interface between computational neuroscience and data science. And we think that this skill set will be useful for scientist jobs of the future. And indeed, here at the Allen Institute, we have hired former students uh, in the domains of modeling and, and data science and analysis um, because of that background. So one final avenue of outreach that I would like to talk about uh, as being related to this course um, is a, <clears throat> a new pilot project here at the Allen Institute um, that we're piloting this year. So this is the Allen Brain Observatory Open Scope Project. Uh, this project stems from Christoph's vision of a new model of neuroscientific research. Inspired by astronomical observatories, the basic idea is that external researchers can develop and design experiments that could be run on our highly standardized uh, brain observatories. And as an alpha test for this model, we reached out to the, the former students um, to participate in, in, in a first round test. And very encouragingly, uh, we received nine applications that are currently under a review, one of which will be selected for data generation next year. So with that, I'll hand it over to data, or David, who will <laughs> <laughs> talk about closing the feedback loop uh, to improve our products and uh, programs at the Allen Institute. Hi, I'm data. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about some of the cool stuff we get back at the Institute because of the cool things that happen at the course. Um, let's see. Right, so I think first and foremost, this course is really great for helping us understand how we need to improve our tools to have a better impact. And just have to say, there's, there's really nothing like standing in front of a big room with a lot of blank stares to help you understand that you're not explaining yourself very well, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, this has happened to me any number of times at the course every year. Uh, we take our tools out there, it's code that I've written, I'm trying to get people to understand how to use. And, you know, it makes me think, right, if, if I have a person next to me and I can't get them there when they're asking me questions to understand the tool that I've made for them, you know, how much harder is it for somebody who's not actually just right next to me, right? How much harder is, for, is it for all of our other users? So what we're looking at right here is our GitHub issue tracker for the LNSCK. Uh, this is a place where people will report bugs. Hey, what happened? Why does this work anymore? Uh, request features like, say, uh, let's make transgenic line searching case insensitive, simple stuff like that to more complicated things. Um, <clears throat> it creates sort of like an open dialogue, right? Uh, people can talk about the importance of these issues, that sort of thing. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit, 
Uh, we can see some issues in particular that were opened by Elijah Christensen, so he did the course this year. What was fascinating about this was he opened and resolved these issues himself before the course started. All right, so this was pretty cool, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> but uh, I think this just goes to show that, that GitHub is actually not just a source code repository. It's actually a social network for software development. All right, so uh, I think this is something that we're learning to take to heart, right? It's really hard to respond quickly to people when they have problems because we're all busy. Um, <clears throat> and honestly, uh, when we first put the LNSDK up on GitHub, I have to say, I didn't really know what we were getting into. Uh, one of the first pull requests we got, so a pull request is when someone contributes code and says, hey, please integrate this. One of the first pull requests we got was when somebody went through and um, touched almost all of our files and made them Python 3 compatible. Right? So this is something I really wanted. This is the dream of open source. Oh my gosh, somebody's doing all this work for me. Uh, but I will rephrase this. Somebody went through and touched all of my files. Uh, <laughs> And I didn't know if it was still going to work after I integrated it, right? So this is not his problem, right? This is my problem because this is a lesson that we have to learn here. To do collaborative software development, you actually have to do automated testing. This is actually really important. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> next. Uh, another thing that's really important is it teaches us uh, how to improve our documentation. Again, so sitting next to somebody, uh, walking them through the Jupyter Notebook you painstakingly put together online to help people understand your tool. If they can't get it, how much harder is it going to be for somebody who can't ask me questions in person? All right, so this is a really important piece of feedback we're taking to heart right now. And we're actually in the process, multiple people in the room right now are in the process of refactoring this and all of our other documentation to hopefully make it more accessible to people. Uh, other cool thing, uh, it, it's a bit funny to say, but this course kind of reminds us to have fun with science, right? Uh, I remember when Marina Garrett first came back from uh, her, her first stint at Friday Harbor, she couldn't stop talking about how much fun it was, right? What a great environment, so much excellent collaboration going on, everybody working together, not necessarily on the same problems, but together in the same space. Uh, and so there was kind of a grassroots movement here at the Institute to try to recapitulate that here. Uh, so, you know, on our, on our putative no meeting Thursdays, which doesn't work that way, but no meeting Thursdays, our scientists actually encourage each other just to go up to our cafe, go up to our library, uh, break out their laptops, work together on problems, even if they're not working on the same problems. Uh, it's led to presentations about tools people are excited about, um, and even uh, most recently led to an offsite where uh, a bunch of scientists <laughs> said, we got some work we need to do, we've got some interesting projects that we need to work on, let's take ourselves away from our normal work environment and get a lot of work done. And I think everybody agrees that this was pretty cool. Uh, probably most interesting for me is it forces me to think about uh, how we at the Institute ought to serve our data. Right, so <clears throat> I'll just take a step back for a second. You know, we started the course the first year, we took our, our, our servers and our API up there, right? And we said, okay, everybody download all the data, and then the internet went down. Okay, so we don't do that anymore. The next year, we took up the hard drives, right? The hard drives are great, but as Nika said, this is like, this is like Sophie's choice. Uh, how much data do we put on the hard drives? Can we put the raw data on the hard drives? Probably not. So which experiments do we do? Do we do our highest resolution process data, right? So these are all kind of irritating questions to think about, irritating important questions to think about. <clears throat> but again, this is like a, and this is what led us to uh, start investigating AWS, Jupyter Hub, all of this, like cloud deployment. So, so again, all this is just a microcosm for the community at large, right? Everybody wants access to our data. Um, I can't make a hard drive for everybody. So what are we gonna do? All right. So let me take our calcium movies as a specific example, right? So we have, each one is about 60 gigabytes. Uh, there are 650 of these uh, that we gave to the students in Amazon's cloud. That's about 40 terabytes of data if I did my math right. So uh, here's my solution. Uh, I'm calling this our cloud data pilot. The bucket that has all of this data in it is uh, public now. So if you want a link and you want to download it, go for it. Uh, so let me emphasize, this is a pilot. Uh, these are new technologies to all of us. We're still figuring out exactly how we want to use them. Uh, most important, it's a pilot because uh, this is expensive. We need to figure out if this is a cost model we can afford to maintain as a distribution platform moving forward. But we're really excited to find out if this is how people want to access their data. Um, I'm running out of time. I'll just say this course is really important to us because it's a, it's a really focused way for us to find out how people want to use our data and our tools, which is exciting. Um, so I'm back at our, our beginning, right? This is how people tell me you're supposed to end talks. Uh, so we have Christoph and Adrian. They had this great vision for a course. I have to say, it's been pretty wildly successful so far. Um, 
you know, in hindsight, maybe I shouldn't have used a picture where the students all look kind of distressed. Uh, <laughs> but, but suffice it to say, it's because of the eclipse, not because of my documentation. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. So we have a, we've got a few minutes for questions. I'm wondering how you select the sort of distribution between postdocs, students, maybe even undergrads. Um, is there a quota at each level or you just go for the best applicants? Um, so we don't really put a quota on grad student versus postdoc. We sort of roughly target senior grad student, beginning postdoc. I wouldn't say we necessarily already hit, always hit that. Sometimes we have entering grad students that are, that are particularly uh, exceptional um, or, or late postdocs. Uh, the bigger constraints that we worry about are the mixture of the student body as a whole um, and the balance of expertise. So we don't want everybody to be from the same background. We really want a, a mixture of backgrounds that complement each other. I don't think we collect that information. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we do we collect guess, it. We don't, we don't release it. <laughs> Not equivalent answer. <laughs> so my question pertains to you know, accessibility of the data. So you're doing this pilot, you're doing these experiments with people that you selected from a pool of 200 that will have a lot of uh, skills and that will go through the process that's probably not going to illustrate the reality of most of the scientists right there. So what is your you know, next step to address that problem? Maybe I could ask you a follow-up. So, so, or ask you for a clarification. Are you saying, are you wondering how we're going to extend this pilot to make it easier for everybody to access data that maybe aren't so tech savvy? Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Um, so it's a really great question, right? I have this dream. Uh, I don't know if it's an affordable dream. I have a dream that uh, you go to our website and you can click a link. I'm looking at some data I find interesting. You click a link and uh, it'll open a notebook right there, right? Do the analysis right there. Everything's ready to go. Uh, there's a lot of work that goes into that and there's a lot of commitment to uh, putting our data in a place that's very expensive. So this is part of the point of the pilot is to find out uh, is this something that we should invest in? So um, I have a question regarding the courses. Have you tried to make all this online, like like Coursera or Khan Academy, that they have these courses online and anybody sh could listen to it? Uh, so we've talked about that. One thing I actually forgot to say is the course material that we put together, the Jupyter Notebooks and so forth, is actually publicly available. Um, if you go to GitHub and look for SWDB 2017, you can see the last year's uh, Jupyter Notebooks for all of the, the data sets and all of the modeling tools and so forth, which come complete with, um, these, are, these are intended to be pedagogical tools, so they, they have both um, some explanation, they have problem sets, and they have solutions for those problem sets so that you can work through all of that yourself uh, if you are so inclined. Um, <clears throat> I have a question, a uh, follow-up from Renata's question. How much time are you spending um, like writing the code versus serving the community and answering questions? And do you have a threshold for what you respond to? So if someone says, how do I open Python versus, okay, in this line of the code, I want to tweak this and the other, would it work? So there was the Python bootcamp, and we want, we want everyone to have some uh, basic level of fluency. At the same time, uh, and we ha also have a, a, a great cohort of TAs, we have a good ratio of TAs to students, uh, we also highly encourage the students to work in teams and actually require it. Um, so, and, and we also encourage students to work with others who have complementary skill sets. So to the extent that uh, you can't open Python, 
your first, uh, well, your first line of defense would be the boot camp. Then it would be your neighbor, your teammate, a TA. So I, I think there are various, various answers to that. For more complex things, we may do an um, impromptu workshop. In some cases, students that are particularly familiar with a, a, an algorithm or, or a piece of code, they'll give a workshop on, uh, on, on that aspect, and, and, and students will come listen. OK. Thank you very much to the team. Oh, oh sorry. So um, you guys accepted 10% of the applicants. Are you considering the possibility that you might be able to expand a bit? Or do you think that you've reached the sort of maximal capacity? We have certainly reached the maximal capacity at Friday Harbor Laboratories, which is an absolute fantastic venue. It's on Anacortes Island. It's associated with UW. So to the extent that we expanded, um, we would have to rethink that. We also like. We like the, 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 smaller, the smaller size of the course such that we can have a high TA to student ratio. Um, so we'll have to think about that in the future. But we, we've also thought about extending the courses to, to other locations. And, and you know, we've, we've put a lot of effort into developing the course material, all of the Jupyter notebooks, the Python boot camp. This could be packaged uh, for a course uh, we like the idea of an on-site course because we think, we think there's a lot, a lot to be gained by, by genuine human interaction, but uh, we'll see. Okay. Thank you again to the team.